if we don't get through everything today, we'll just do it next class. Um, Cause uh, if I'm not stuff on talk about, all right, this, if anybody asks me what like stream ecology is, I'm just going to show them this figure. This, this is stream ecology. As you can clearly see, it's very interesting. No. <laughs> Um, so last time we were talking about, you know, food webs, ecosystem effects. And, uh, you know, we made the point that uh, even in a fairly small stream, which Broadstone stream was, you can get into a, a really complicated set of relationships among species. And again, this diagram doesn't say anything about the amount of energy moving in each of these pathways. It just says that species are connected. Um, and... So if we think about nutrients, um, where are most of these species getting their nutrients in this food web? They take their one a day stream fish health vitamins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. You, as usual, you guys are going like on a whole other level than what I was thinking. I, so I guess the first place I went was that like, you know, all of these things are cons consumers, which you can't see over there. Um, you know, so all of these above trophic level one are, are consumers. So, so for them, it's just a matter of uh, of feeding on organisms that have fixed those nutrients for them, right? Like they're not so concerned about what the nutrients are like in the stream, as long as they get what they get to feed on, they get all the nutrients that they require, right? And certainly, yeah, where those nutrients originally derived uh, from is gonna depend on where we are along that river continuum. Um, and then th this, this bottom, part with with the with the, our producers um you know these are um tasked with uh taking carbon dioxide sunlight and nutrients right and turning it into to biomass right that moves up the food web and uh and so yeah so as, as torn mentioned like if we're way up in the headwaters of course uh this could be terrestrial derived of course, particulate organic matter, and it may be getting nutrients out of the soil ultimately, right? If they're leaves. Uh, but if we're talking about paraphyton and things in the stream, um, they need to get it from the stream water. Bacteria could depend on where it is, similar with FPOM, could be terrestrial, could be aquatic. Uh, and again, just looking at the number of species connected, one of the things that blew my mind with this food web is just how relatively few connections are common from autochthonous production, right? Uh, which is kind of the, I guess, kind of take a message from Headwaters and the RCC anyway. So, so just to review, um, when we think of autochthonous production in the stream, we need to think about what uh, these plant species need to build their, their plant tissue, right? And so al algae in general, have uh, a ratio um, of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus of 106 to 16 to one. And so, so they have to find, you know, more nitrogen than phosphorus. And then of course, even more carbon, but of course they get that from carbon dioxide and that's rarely limiting, right? There's plenty of that around. So, um, so uh, you know, they have to they have to be finding enough nutrients to keep growing. As we mentioned, um, the ratios of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in streams depend on where you are geographically. But nitrogen and phosphorus are again what, what we call the macronutrients. Like those are the ones you need the most of. Like there can be some other things that are important in some places, but really, it's primarily about nitrogen um, and and phosphorus. So. If we think of like in general, what a nutrient cycle might look like in a stream, we've got some inorganic ions and organic ions. What, what, what's the difference in those? What does something need to be for it to be an organic ion of, of in this case, 
nitrogen or phosphorus? What does it mean for it to be organic? So most of these are associated with living tissue, yes. Um, and it, it has to have some carbon hydrogen bond in it as well. And so, right, organic and living in some ways are interchangeable, but chemically it needs to have, um, yeah, some carbon hydrogen bonds in it to be considered organic. Um, so, so these inorganic ions, are what are gonna be taken up by our producers. So like our paraphyton on these rocks. Um, and of course, when they take that up and when they turn that into their plant tissue, then they turn it into things that the plant uses it for. What are some of the things? Well, actually I'll hold that thought for one second. Okay, and then all of the, um, all of the nutrient ions in the paraphyton in this case, in a real simple cycle um, could be consumed say by the central stone rollers by the haptogenia mayflies, um, by uh, grazing caddisflies or mayflies, any of these, right? Then as these producers excrete waste or as their bodies decompose, uh, then the organic ions in their body are transformed back into inorganic ions. So through urine and feces, uh, but then also through um, body decomposition. And then again, they're available for uptake by our producers. So um, we've got, you know, a real simple cycle here. Um, can we think of an example of some organic and inorganic nutrient ions that are important in nutrient cycling? Anything come to mind? So let's say for like an inorganic ion, like what are some of the inorganic ions that are important to, to production? And again, these are species of phosphorus and nitrogen. Phosphine, phosphine, phosphine. There's a phosphine, it's a gas. I'm unfamiliar with phosphine. As a wetland person, you may know more about it. What? And is it, is it taken up by plants? Huh, okay. Yeah, I've heard of phosphine gas, but I know very little about how it interacts, yeah. But phosphorus, yeah, if it's related to phosphorus, it's probably gonna connect into that cycle somehow for sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, nitrite would be for sure. Yeah, nitrate. So I, I just came up with a couple examples. So like nitrate was one thing that I mentioned, but yeah, it could be could be nitrite, nitrate, ammonium. Um, then on the phosphorus side, orthophosphate is probably the biggest one. Um, but yeah, and so then that's taken up, and then the the paraphyton turns it into all those molecules. So it takes up in this example um, nitrates. But the algae doesn't need nitrate in its body. What it needs are things like uh, amino acids, right? That make up their proteins. They need nitrogen to do that. Um, uh, cell membranes need nitrogen. So all of these organic ions, you know, the stone roller doesn't have to take up nitrate because it can get the amino acids ready made as it were, right? From directly from consuming this. Cool. Um, so where are these ions going to be coming from? If we think of these inorganic ions, first of all, how are those going to be coming to the water where our paraphyton is? What are some of the pathways, the sources? Yeah, so terrestrial runoff of fertilizer for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, groundwater, absolutely. Yeah, you guys, you guys nailed two of the big ones. So it can come in from surface runoff, from from groundwater, um, or or sediment. So that gets it onto the benthic layer, right? Uh, there's a tiny bit from the atmosphere. Although that's although that that's primarily um, elemental nitrogen, um, and then yeah, you know. Eh. This is going to be N2 is what this is going to be. Not so much these inorganic, not so much these bioavailable ions. And then, of course, you all knew this, but but upstream, right? So 
ultimately where this rock is sitting in the river continuum is going to determine how much of this stuff is available because it's all going to be washing down, right? Um, okay. So in general, these inorganic ions um, are what are going to be determining what's limiting. So when we want to talk about like, um, is a certain stream productivity phosphorus or nitrogen limited? Really what we're going to need to know about are these inorganic ions. Cause of course they're the form that's going to be uh, taken up by our, uh, our producers. All right. So these inorganic ions um, are really going to be um, going to be most important. And so you can measure concentrations of these um, in streams. Cool. So let's chat about nitrogen first. Uh, so we saw one example of dissolved, I mentioned kind of mentioned some of these already. So the most important inorganic nitrogen species um, are nitrate, nitrite, and ammonium. So if we want to know how much, uh, you know, bioavailable nitrogen we have in a stream, um, those are the, those are the, the species that we're going to want to look at. So these are going to be dissolved in the water, right? They're going to be suspended in the water. Um, they're charged, of course, so they'll be held in suspension by associating with uh, the dipole water molecules, right? Um, and so, so they'll be they'll be held up in suspension, carried uh, down the stream uh, until there are producers that are able to assimilate them um, as they're making their bodies. Um, and so these are inorganic in the sense that there's no carbon hydrogen bonds in them at all. Um, what are some of the organic nitrogen molecules that might be dissolved and floating down the stream? Think of like molecules that are important to living organisms. What are like some of the molecules that all living organisms use, whether you're an algae or an elephant. It's kind of crazy when you stop and think about it, right? There are molecules that you need as a living organism, whether you're an algae or an elephant. I like the way I said that. No, not really. Yeah, Isabel. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, DNA. DNA has got a little bit of everything in it. Deoxyribonucleic acid, it's got your the phospholipid backbone, it's got all this stuff. Yeah, so so um, good examples. Some of the biggest ones that have nitrogen in them, um, you know, amino acids are, and protein. So an amine group, of course, is nitrogen. So there, there could be other examples. I just mentioned a couple, but um, but yeah, so these are all coming from living organisms, uh, but they're also polar. They're huge, right? These are huge molecules. So parts of them are positively charged, parts are negatively charged. And so those will connect with our water molecules and keep them flowing down, downstream. Um, so we can also have uh, particulate sources of nitrogen uh, and, you know, these can be all kinds of things. I mean, particles, these could be squirrels. Um, but then on the smaller scale, things like bacteria, detritus, right? All these particles that get into the water are also going to be sources of um of nitrogen, of course, they're going to be organic because heck, if it's bacteria, it's still in a living form. Um, but detritus, those are the breakdown products of living organisms. So, so this is all the nitrogen that's coming down the river. Did we ever come up with our stream ecology playlist? Have we done that yet? Yeah. That's cool. Did you? Did you? Hi. Oh, really? I need that. Okay. I need to check that. So is that the best way to share it? That's awesome. I was just thinking of like stuff flowing down the river. Then I thought of rolling on the river, you know, and then it just went from there. Okay. We need to do that. So all this stuff moving downstream. So um, just a little cartoon. This from an intro environmental science textbook. Thinking of the global nitrogen cycle. What are some of the key components of the global nitrogen cycle? If someone were to say, you guys ever heard of like an elevator speech? Like think of a topic that you can say something on in about like 30 seconds or something. Like they say you should have your own personal elevator speech about like 
kind of like your interests, what you want to do for your career in case you just happen to be in an elevator with like, I don't know, the head of like the nature conservancy or something. And he or she's like, I don't even know if he or she he's like, Hey, so, you know, what are, what, what are you doing? And you're like, well, <laughs> and then the elevator door opens and you're like, ah, I should have said something. But anyway, um, so if you were to give like a real short, like, I don't know, what would be some of the parts of your elevator speech about the nitrogen cycle? Like what makes it important? What's important about the nitrogen cycle? What's going on here? Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, you definitely want to say something about the largest uh, sort of, yeah, pool of nitrogen, nitrogen in the atmosphere. Then you got to have bacteria to make it available. Absolutely. That's awesome. That's awesome. And this cartoon has a lot going on in it. But once uh, once we have uh, bacteria that have 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 fixed fixed it to ammonium, and then um, potentially uh, nitrified it uh, to other species, then it can cycle locally, right? So then once it's in these bioavailable forms, it gets taken up by plants and then can cycle between plants and animals locally, as we saw earlier. Think, and then we, of course, we have our little tractor on here. Why do we have our little tractor on here? I know some of y'all have me for interest. Like I've seen this figure before, right? Yes, you have. Farms, yes. And how do farms affect the nitrogen cycle? Lots of fertilizers, absolutely. So. The same things that are happening in our terrestrial realm happen in, in the water. So atmospheric nitrogen dissolves uh, in water. And so you have N2 in the water. Similarly, we have bacteria that do all the same things that happen in the soil on land uh, in streams. So all these same processes essentially are going on in, in streams as well, right? So we need to break down the non-reactive elemental nitrogen um, and turn it into forms that are more bioavailable. Um, so ammonia or ammonium, and then cycling back to around to nitrates um, as well. Okay, so here is your uh, diagram with a lot going on on it. So let's think about nitrogen and what it does in streams. And this is like the surface of our stream right here. This is the atmosphere. Uh, and so the water's flowing from left to right. This, the bottom of the stream is here. And so if we think first of all about the major nitrogen inputs, where, where are they coming? So imagine you've got a rock, right? A rock is sitting like in here somewhere, whatever. Where are those major nitrogen inputs coming from? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So if we were to just to list the sources, and we definitely have um, a lock thinness input here. Uh, and then so that a lock thinness can come from upstream, right? It can be leached out of these. It can be ultimately excreted by shredders as they've broken it down. So it's coming from upstream. So we've got kind of three compartments that we want to look at relative to our stream, the atmosphere, upstream and groundwater. Of course, the atmosphere is just supplying this elemental nitrogen. Uh, but then both upstream and downstream can provide all the different varieties. All right. So as was mentioned, groundwater itself can provide nutrients, particularly if there's agriculture going on nearby that can get on down into, um, into the groundwater and can uh, cause localized productivity. Okay. So the next thing to think about is just to follow our atmospheric nitrogen along. So in streams, cyanobacteria are our nitrogen fixers. And it's actually, a, it's, it's, a, it's a form of algae. And so they're able to, to, to work with atmospheric nitrogen. Um, and so they are able, uh, are able to fix it into these different forms. So the atmospheric nitrogen comes to our cyanobacteria. There's nothing else that can deal with it. If we don't have cyanobacteria in our stream, then that atmospheric nitrogen, it's just inert gas is all that it is. 
Okay. Um, well, so that's how that's that's how we turn the the elemental nitrogen into these different species. But of course, we can already have concentrations of these that could have leached out of the leaves, could have uh, come out from excretion, um, could have been uh, could have uh, leached out of our um, our producers as well. So these are going to be the most important, as I mentioned, with regard to nitrogen, the most important bioavailable inorganic nitrogen. It's uh, ammonium and nitrate. So again, um, this is all going to have to come into our, our system, either uh, from upstream or from the groundwater. So we could have ammonium and nitrate that are flowing to us from upstream. It could be coming in from the groundwater, but at some point it's been fixed by that um, by that cyanobacteria. There's another name for cyanobacteria you might have heard. It's just called blue-green algae. So that nitrogen has been fixed at some point. It could have been terrestrial by uh, our bacteria and come into our plants and then those plants wash into the stream um, or it could have been fixed by these blue-green algae in our streams. So once it's in that bioavailable form, then it can be assimilated, right? Then it can be assimilated by our producers here. At that point, uh, this is what all this is, you know, we have a cycle that moves this way, right? So at that point, it's taken up by our producers, um, which uh, will ultimately die or be taken up by our consumers. Uh, and so once um, things die, uh, then it can get mineralized back into these inorganic forms, right? So they enter as inorganic forms, get turned um, into organic forms in the living organisms. And then ultimately are either excreted or mineralized after they, as they're decomposing, back into these forms. And through this whole thing, remember that we have this unidirectional movement of everything. So, so whatever's in our stream has come from upstream. And then whatever's happening here locally is sending stuff further downstream again. Right? So if we have blue-green algae that are fixing nitrogen here, um, the ammonium, uh, and then ultimately the nitrates that they um, are creating are going to keep going downstream. Any questions so far? There's a lot going here, and I always feel like I'm skipping something. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, and so then this is just showing assimilation, right? And then moving moving on down. Okay, now back in this locality, one important thing to realize is that there are two processes going on. We have denitrification and we have nitrification. And the most important thing to realize with this is the presence of oxygen. So with nitrification, we're starting with ammonium and we're essentially adding more oxygen is a good way, is one way to think of that. I don't know if it's a good way, it's the way I think of it. We're adding oxygen. So now imagine our stream and there are some parts of that stream that have lots of oxygen and some parts of that stream that don't have much oxygen. And so parts of the stream that have a lot of oxygen available it's going to be easier for nitrification to occur. So it's going to be easier to change ammonium into nitrate in areas that have lots of oxygen. What parts of the stream are likely to have lots of oxygen? Headwaters? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And even looking locally, like it, some, you know, imagine like the Sweeten Creek site or the Beach Tree Creek site, site, even like within that one site, like there was, there'd be variation, right? In the amount of oxygen, like even within that site, what would be some places that would have high oxygen versus low oxygen? Yeah. So the atmosphere generally has higher oxygen concentrations in the water. So wherever you have mixing, that's going to be where your highest oxygen levels are. And you all know the lesson of like the carbonated beverage. How does temperature affect streams ability to, to hold oxygen? Yeah, colder water holds more oxygen, right? So places where we have a lot of mixing and colder waters, like in the headwaters, we're going to have more oxygen. Okay, so where we have more oxygen, we're more likely to see nitrification, where we go from ammonium toward nitrate. So on the other hand, uh, where we have very low levels of oxygen, we're going to see it move in the other way. Denitrification. Now that's one of the places that's going to happen is in the sediment, right? Because in the sediment, we're not likely to have much oxygen because it's going to be, especially if it's covered over with, um, uh, with small fine particles, things like clay and sand, it's going to, it's going to lock that away from the water. And we're still going to have things like bacteria that are aerobic that are using oxygen, but there's not going to be a lot coming in. So the balance between nitrification and denitrification is going to depend on how much oxygen we have. Yes. So where we have um, low oxygen, we're going to go from nitrate um, back, losing those oxygens. Uh, whereas with uh, high oxygen, we're going to have, we're going to have nitrification happening. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions about this? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you're right. So, this would be happening probably like down in the sediment. Um, and then, if that N2 gas, you're right, were to, were to, were to enter the stream, you're probably still going to have higher N2 in the atmosphere, right? So, it's probably going to be, um, yeah, that's a good question, Michael. So, you know, I guess it would it would depend on how much mixing was going on. So if you had a lot of mixing going on in the atmosphere, um, yeah, the, the, the net, you know, when you have low oxygen, there's going to be movement toward like toward N2. And then up here at the surface where there's high oxygen because of all the mixing, you're also going to have N2. I mean, the, the bottom line is if you don't have a lot of, the cyanobacteria, the, 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 the N2 in the atmosphere and the water could be pretty similar because when it goes into the water, it doesn't have a lot happening to it. The vast majority of the nitrogen dynamics are going on with, um, with, um, with nitrate and ammonium. So those are by far the most active ones. Um, you know, the, the, the N2, but for it to become nitrate and ammonium, at some point it had to get fixed. And so it was either in the terrestrial realm with bacteria or um, in the aquatic realm with these blue-green algae. Um, but, but yeah, that's an interesting point that this is happening in the sediment producing N2. But we'd also expect a lot of N2 up here because of mixing with the atmosphere. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, no. So, so denitrification, and and uh, there are also bacteria that that are involved in these processes as, as as well, right? That are facilitating these processes. So, so basically, denitrification. I mean, it's an equilibrium reaction, right? Where we're going to have all three of these, but in differing levels, right? So, when there's not a lot of oxygen around, we're less likely to see nitrates and more likely to have 
either nitrite or um, or elemental nitrogen. But this is mostly what the plants are going to be taken up. Right. So that's what this arrow of assimilation means. This so so when there's low oxygen, it's bad for the plants because this isn't going to be as abundant, if that makes sense. So really, I mean, when you want to know how much nutrients are in a stream for like estimate, like thinking about productivity, you know, really nitrate and ammonium is 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 pretty much all that folks measure. So think of it, you know, processes that give you more nitrate are going to make it more productive because there's more for the plants to use. But if it's a low oxygen environment that's driving it this way, um, then you're not going to have as much available for those plants to assimilate. And I don't know if you, if you can tell, but this is kind of making the point with the sediment here on the side that like deeper down in our sediment will have less oxygen, um, you know, and, and so that's where you'd be more likely to be losing your nitrate, for instance. Which is bad if you have rooted plants because they might want to be pulling nitrate out of there. But in a lot of streams, you know, most of our producers are the paraphyton on the rocks, which is really only going to be um, affected by what's suspended in the water for the most part. Other questions? <laughs> and as much as we study all these processes and the effects of oxygen and all that, uh, when we just dump a whole lot of ammonium and nitrate onto the land for agricultural purposes, that is really what drives stream productivity because there's so much more that gets washed in from agricultural land than is being, you know, fixed by the cyanobacteria. So, yeah, <laughs> one of those things where like the human impacts kind of like override um, natural processing rates. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, let's chat about phosphorus a little bit. Um, so I mentioned kind of the main inorganic phosphorus species. I remember which one it was. And I now want to look up phosphine gas and what role it plays in the stream phosphorus cycle. I don't know. Do you know how it's produced? Oh yeah, right. Maybe that's where I heard it. Maybe that's where I heard of it. Okay. So, so ortho, like if you look at like plant food, like it's always going to have orthophosphate in it. That's, um, that's really the primary inorganic uh, phosphorus species. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Ah, gosh, these say, pho ah, sorry. I don't know how that happened. Um, so similar thing, all these, um, so this should say phosphorus. So these nucleic acids have a heck of a lot of phosphorus in them. Um, and then similarly, like any, you know, living organisms are going to have, be rich in phosphorus in varieties that are useful to organisms. Apologies for that. Um, so, yeah, so again, we're going to have, just like the nitrogen, we're going to have phosphorus that, that's, that's dissolved, uh, suspended up in the water, both inorganic and organic, and then we're going to have particulate forms as well. Uh, okay, real quick elevator speech. How does the phosphorus cycle differ from the nitrogen cycle globally? Yep, absolutely. So there's a mineral source rather than an atmospheric source. Yeah, and so it's going to be washed down in the soil. Um, can, you know, we don't have bacteria that need to make it available here. Um, and again, it can cycle locally. Again, ag having a big impact. Okay, but the, yeah, but so the big difference is, is the source. And this is actually a big deal in Appalachians because I think, as I mentioned, um, this is going to be coming from sedimentary rock. Um, and with igneous and metamorphic rock, there's, there's, there's not much phosphorus that gets supplied naturally. And so our headwater be beautiful streams like the Davidson are not very productive just because there's not a big natural influx of uh, phosphorus. 
in fact, it's kind of funny. The Davidson, the Bobby Setzer, Setzer hat tree there. Um, the, the, have, have any of y'all been to that hatchery there on the Davidson? Lots of trout being fed, lots of trout waste, uh, which goes into uh, the Davidson River downstream from the hatchery. I mean, it's, you know, it's not toxic stuff. It's just nutrients is really what it is. Um, and so when you look at like benthic invertebrate populations upstream and downstream from that hatchery, like big difference, which trout fishermen love because that means there's more invertebrates for the trout to eat. So it's a more productive fishery as a whole. So that kind of makes the point again, that there's not a whole lot of natural weathering of phosphate uh, rock and input there. All right. So importance of geological processes. All right. So, so phosphorus uh, in streams. Just to orient you here, we've got the water column and sediment. And so sediment dynamics are a little more important with phosphorus. And again, I'm not gonna talk about everything here. I'm just gonna highlight some of the points that I think um, are, are most important. And of course we don't have an atmospheric component here, right? Cause we, you know, there's not, I guess, phosphine gas in the atmosphere, unless you're in, was it Venus? Venus, if you're Venus, there's phosphine here and something be going on, I don't know. Um, but, you know, we, we, we could, so whatever the phosphorus input um, comes in, we've got processes going on in the water column and in the sediment. So the first thing to note is this really important dynamic of um, phosphorus uh, being uh, adsorbed onto clay particles. Okay, so clay particles have a negative charge. And these phosphorus species get bound to the to those those particles, and a lot of them will settle out of the water column. So one of the things that's going to affect this is if you have a lot of turbidity in a stream, the phosphorus is become, is going to become bound to those particles and then eventually settle out. Whereas if you don't have a whole lot of turbidity, it's gonna it's gonna stay um, it's gonna stay suspended. So when it first enters the stream, the form that it takes is gonna depend on whether it comes in contact with um, with some of these clay particles. Okay, um, and then you know I mean similar to nitrogen, we're gonna have like uptake. Uh, and, and release, right? So um, uptake by um, initially our, our producers and then our consumers as well can be released again um, through through waste release. Decomposition, which may happen down at the bottom of our stream. Um, and so, you know, so in that case, phosphor will move down uh, toward the bottom. And again, because phosphorus is associated with these clay particles, that can cause it to, to kind of accumulate in the sink kind of at the bottom of the stream. So that's kind of how it gets taken out of the, of the water column. And you'll notice we're distinguishing here between labile particulate. What, what does labile mean again? <laughs> so, so labile means like, like reactive essentially. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so, so when something's labile, it just means it's active, it's moving around, it's been, it's, it's reacting with things. So some of that phosphorus could be firmly bound to the sediment, not available, but then there's other stuff that is, and there's stuff that's soluble as well. Um, so, I mean, really the main thing that I, I just want you to be aware of is the propensity for phosphorus to get bound and move down into the sediment. If you have clear water with um, large substrate particles, that's not gonna be as much of a dynamic uh, and then it'll, it'll be more uh, available, but otherwise it can come down here. And have you, have you heard, heard this term in fauna? We know what that means. They use it a lot in marine systems. Literally things that live like in the sediment, like burrowing forms. Like we have some mayflies that do that, some midges, all those kinds of things. So, so when the, when that, um, you know, in pools, for instance, where we have fine substrate settling out, uh, it, that can be an important um, 
it, it can be it can be brought back into the food web through the in fauna right so if we have burrowing mayflies that use it for instance um then then that can move it back up um so yeah so so phosphorus uh just realized you know the natural source would be would be erosion of that sedimentary rock uh, and then its association with um, with clay particles can get it out of the water column. Um, but we're not worried at all here with bacteria transforming things. When it gets into the stream, it is what it is. It can be used. Um, and so, and we're not even talking about different uh, species of it here. Um, this is, you sometimes hear the term pore water uh, to talk about concentration of water that that's that, that, that's moving through the subsurface. So we, we talk about um, the hyporheic zone. I don't know if y'all have ever seen that term before. I think we mentioned it briefly, but I might not have written it out. Um, so hyporheic. So hyporheic just means kind of below the flow of the water. So in the hyporheic zone, uh, we're gonna have we'll have water flowing in the substrate as well, and so it can it can be down in there. Um, yeah, so driven by geology, um, also setting, settling out of the water from geology. Uh, and so these dynamics that are going on below the surface can be important, especially you'll notice these are areas where we have sediment. So you should be thinking like low flow, deeper water, right? Those are places where we might have rooted macrophytes, right? Those are places where we might have like cattails and things and like some of these wetlands in the side of larger rivers. So when that's the case, um, you know, they can take up those nutrients and bring them bring them back up essentially. Um, yeah, so your book doesn't go into as much detail with the phosphorus cycle, um, but any questions that I might be able to answer or questions that I can't answer for that matter. Cause then I get to make stuff up like phosphine gas. I know nothing about it, but it's interesting. <clears throat> so you'll notice, you know, living organisms not as important with the processing here, right? It's more of a mineral driven kind of thing. All right. So, so anyway, um, when we look at agricultural land, um, you know, it really drives nutrient dynamics. So um, these are data, I think, uh, from Indiana and the Midwest United States uh, somewhere. And so we look at watersheds that are more than 90% forested all the way down to more than 90% agriculture. And um, um, these are organic and inorganic fractions. But anyway, you can see there's just this, this clear increase. So ultimately, when we want to know nutrient concentrations in streams, um, if there's any kind of anthropogenic disturbance going on, um, really the agriculture use is the best predictor of it, essentially. Um, and so why is this important? Well, the stream's ability to uptake and process nutrients is going to determine how much gets exported out, right? And so downstream, the Mississippi River Basin, uh, of course, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's now this, this dead zone where uh, algal productivity is so high that as it decomposes, it sucks up so much oxygen that other species aren't able to live. Uh, and so this is a big, um, uh, big pollution problem because they're important fisheries out here. So to think about how much nutrients make their way all the way out of the Mississippi watershed and don't get taken up by things in the stream, you know, that's going to tell you how much of a problem um, that this this dead zone down here is. 